areas that might be subject to, uh, to development pressures, whether they're living in rural areas and villages. Each In each of these environments, women, different kinds of women, are facing different kinds of challenges. And we know that women are vulnerable. Let me just, for those of you who are a little less familiar with this subject, very quickly note a couple of the additional vulnerabilities that women face that can make it um, really problematic for them to protect, to secure their rights to their homes, their fields, their property during a time like this. Women are vulnerable particularly because they have in many environments limited access to resources, limited abilities to use resources on an equal playing field. We know women are vulnerable to displacements, whether that's coming from and, and evictions, whether that's coming from family pressures, when husbands pass away or other male family members pass away, whether that's the result of investments gone wrong, rather, whether that's the result of infrastructure development. Dis, under a displacement scenario, women may not be compensated equally and may face real loss of their homestead, their fields, the things they depend upon for their livelihoods. We also know women are vulnerable, particularly of the, from the impacts of climate change and natural disasters. So um, in areas where you have compounding problems, as in uh, the Bay of Bengal this past weekend, we can expect to see women facing a compounded series of threats from natural disasters associated with climate change and weak tenure rights. And of course, on top of all of that, there's the continuing problem of discriminatory laws and practices and biases. And so COVID threatens in a very real way, a very tangible way to exacerbate an already unequal situation for many women. Okay, I'm gonna, for that, let me pause for a moment. Um, recognizing all those vulnerabilities and challenges, this webinar is going to focus on women's land rights and the implications on many vulnerable peoples, different kinds of women who are going to face are dealing with today the extra burdens associated with responding to the virus. We're going to explore today a range of issues. These are going to include how is it women in different countries are actually engaging to address the threats and the challenges today? What's the degree to which women may actually be subject to family-based land grabbing, whether this is widows or whether this is other women, as a result of the local virus? I was speaking last week with Heather Ibrahim Leathers of the Global Fund for Widows, and she wisely said COVID-19 is a widow maker. So how can we be thinking about the challenges widows face uh, during this crisis? We're gonna take a look at land governance and land administration with respect to women's land rights and explore a little bit what land administration offices can and should be doing today and in the future to try to um, mitigate some of the challenges women are facing. And then uh, additionally, we're going to take a look at rising levels of gender-based violence, especially rising levels in the light of requirements that people stay home and therefore may be more exposed to family-based intra-household violence. And, and to do this today, I'm just so thrilled that I have a wonderful group of panelists with me. And we're going to be talking about these issues from a variety of different perspectives. So, so what's going to happen for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to introduce our amazing group of panelists. And then we're going to have a conversation for about, uh, it'll be about 50 minutes by the time we get through our introductions. And we're going to leave the last 30 minutes for you guys to ask us questions. Um, please, if you have questions, you have ideas that come to you during the course of uh, our conversation, please post your questions using the question feature and we will answer those as many as we can during the final hour. So um, without further ado, let me turn to our panelists and introduce you to them. First, uh, we have Ms. Ellen Pratt, who is commissioner hailing from Sino County in Southeastern Liberia. Commissioner Pratt is charged with developing a comprehensive land use and management reform agenda including a national land use planning and management framework in country. And this will be the first inclusive land planning strategy developed in Liberia. 
Madam Pratt's an executive management professional and an urban planning expert. Her specialization is in urban infrastructure development. She has over 20 years experience in public and private sector institutions, both in the United States and in Liberia. Commissioner Pratt, it's so good to have you with us today. Good afternoon and thank you very much, Carol. Of course. So happy to be here. A pleasure. Next, I'm gonna to turn to Patricia, Patricia Chavez. Patricia is executive director of Espaso Feminista and my apologies for murdering the pronunciation. She, uh, Espaso Feminista is a Brazilian feminist NGO that's dedicated to economic and political empowerment of women. At Espaso Feminista, Patricia has developed leadership and skills of rural and urban grassroots women in participation and decision-making. She's especially focused on the linkages between agrarian reform, food security, and women's land rights. She has a strong background in business administration and a postgraduate degree in business studies from the London School of Economics and Political Science, the LSE in London. Her work is dedicated to the empowerment of these rural and urban women. And Patricia is also serving as the ILC Latin America cons Consular and a focal point and a coordinator of the Feminist Land Platform. Patricia, great to have you with us today. Thank you, Thank you very much. Next, I'll turn to Nana Amayira. Nana Ama is the founder and executive director of Colandef, which is an NGO based in Ghana that works to achieve land tenure security. As a land economist, development policy analyst, and gender specialist, Nana has spent over 24 years delivering interventions to support land and natural resources, uh, resource governance and securing women's land rights. She's been a consistent advocate for gender sensitive land governance in Ghana. She also has extensive experience in organizational strengthening, monitoring and evaluation, research and report writing. And she loves to provide coaching to organizations and individual practitioners in these areas. In addition to her work at Colandaf, Nana Ama serves as a member of the advisory committee for other projects led by similar organizations. Nana, thank you so much for joining us today from Ghana. Thank you very much, Carol. The pleasure. And then finally, rounding out our panel today is Ms. Victoria Stanley. Victoria is senior land administration specialist who's worked across Europe and Central Asia, as well as Latin America and Caribbean regions on land administration and land management projects, as well as on rural municipal development. Uh, Victoria has extensive experience in the areas of land administration, land management, rural development, as well as gender issues. She's also worked on information technologies, public service delivery, institutional reform, and strategic planning and budgeting. Victoria, thank you so much for joining us in the US today. Yes, thank you, Carol, for the invitation. I'm very honored. A pleasure. Okay, so you guys can see that we have a, a great panel with us representing different parts of the world, different viewpoints on land administration. I'm gonna go ahead and get us kicked off uh, by asking Commissioner Pratt a question. Um, Commissioner Pratt, I'm wondering if you could share with us how COVID-19 is affecting women in your country and in the communities you're engaged with. I say again, thank you for the invitation to participate in what is a very thought provoking and very important discussion at this time. So from Liberia, let me start by the good news. The good news is our COVID numbers are fairly low. As we look at how this pandemic has ravaged the world, Liberia has 98 active cases, um, 265 cases total, but only 98 active. Um, and so we are very thankful for that because uh, with the stresses that we currently have, that was an additional stress that would have really been uh, tough on our economy and our people. However, despite the low numbers, the country has been in a lockdown for um, over two months. And that, that lockdown was effective um, as of March 16th, when businesses and individuals had to be in their homes by 3 p.m. The lockdown actually said everyone could only come out for one hour a day 
to go shopping, handle essential needs, but everyone needed to be in their home by 3 p.m. That um, lockdown has been extended to being home by 6 p.m. as of this past Saturday. However, for a country that has 54% poverty, a lot of people, and I'll say a lot of our women, work in the informal economy. They live on monies and sustenance they get day to day. So having this reduction in the times that you're able to go out has have a tremendous effect on women, on food security, and on livelihoods. Um, we've seen that with the government shutdown, only about 80% of the staff went home, less than 20% um, with 20% at work. So a lot of people depend on their um, they're in the informal sector, including domestics, who are sent. So a lot of people send their domestic staff home. And um, for some, I'm sorry, you. Uh, it says the host has disabled video. Okay. All right. No problem. So I'll just continue. I don't have the video on. I apologize. I'll continue. So we've had a lot of people who are just not at work. And so they're having a tough time feeding their families. In the rural areas, we've heard that there have been a lot of threats to women who are working on their lands, and primarily because of the lockdown and the lack of enforcement. Um, a lot of women are unable to access their land. There's a lot of illegal encroachments that are happening. And, and for us, there's a challenge because, um, as you know, Liberia passed a very pivotal land rights act in 2018 with um, significant protections for women's land rights and, and equality for women's land rights, which itself is a challenge in a country like Liberia with the patrilineal nature of land ownership and management. So we've seen a lot of gains that we hope are not lost in this time of COVID because of one, the shutdown, because two, the enforcement is not there. And, and you know, three, we may not have that dialogue and communications that we've had before where disputes have been uh, addressed or disputes have been flagged and we've been able to handle it as an institution. Now I'm speaking about the Liberia Land Authority. So I think I'll stop there because I'm sure there are many interesting observations that the other panelists have. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Commissioner Pratt. Really appreciate you getting us kicked off with that insightful comment. Um, so lots of lots of thought, thinking there around how practical, res how restrictions on women's movement create practical challenges for women's livelihood. Patricia, I'm gonna turn to you for the same question. Can you tell us please, how is COVID-19 affecting women in your country and in the communities? Yes, thank you very much. I'd like, first of all, to thank Carol and Landesa and also to thank Neil and Len Porto for this, the opportunity to be here. And um, also to say, you know, my gratitude to be sharing this session with Commission Frank uh, and our colleagues uh, from uh, Kenya and Victoria Extended, from Ghana and Victoria Extended. So thank you very much. And um, let's um, say that Brazil, <laughs> I would spend the whole day, the whole session talking about the crisis, the COVID crisis in Brazil, on top of the political crisis, the humanitarian crisis, the economic crisis, the kind of presidents we have, and the fact that um, Brazil is uh, running very fast to be um, the, in the epicenter of the pandemic because of the lack of awareness and the measures taken by the government, the Brazilian government, right now, our presidents and the national governments are denying the pandemic. They are forcing the population to not to be in isolation. So we have a huge crisis and it's threatening the effort of all the governments. So we are in a struggle, national struggle with our own, let's say government. And uh, I think that uh, COVID in Brazil means a lot. And I, I have to say that the most important thing 
to this for our discussion is how unequal Brazil is in many, many ways. I think that uh, this crisis is revealing the, um, you know, the unfair society that we live. And uh, just to give you an example, Brazil is one of the most unequal uh, country in terms of um, land uh, access to women. Land is very much concentrated in the hands of few and women are the weaker part of this, uh, let's say this equation. And so uh, coming to specifically our area, um, and also 20% of the population is living in extreme poverty. And that's, you know, it's how these people are being affected. And it's not our saying, it's just a, a World Bank uh, report that was uh, uh, released. So we have 30% of our population living in extreme poverty. And most of them are women and they are living in our favelas. It's very important to say that Brazil has a very high uh, rate of urbanization. We are like 80, 82% of the population is living in the cities. And also on the top of this, we have this problem of um, inequality and informality, inequality in the terms of uh, uh, access to housing. And we have a massive numbers of people living in, uh, in our uh, favelas. And one third uh, of the, the population is um, one third of the population, which means 66.3 million family depend on the informal incomes. So uh, same as um, commissioner was saying, we have on the top of inequality, we have a huge problem of informality. We have like half of our population is said to be invisible, invisible for the policies that the governments are trying to put for to cope with this uh, COVID. We have a large number of uh, people living in the favelas, in the slums. And for those people, there is no water, no sanitation, and no garbage collection, which is a drama. Can we imagine coping with COVID, coping with isolation, being in a favela? where there is a high density of people. We have a map of Sao Paulo, where there is a, you know, one of the most affected areas right now. And if you see the, the map of Sao Paulo, you see the problem of inequality. And we are talking about people living like three or more people sharing the same room. So how can you protect yourself from someone that's ill, if you have to share the room with three or four people in the same house. So Patricia, thank you so much for highlighting a number of those challenges in Brazil. I did, I'm gonna pivot a little bit over to Nana now. So you were focused on inequality issues, real challenges and urban issues. Thanks so much for highlighting those. Nana, I wanted to ask you, I understand that the virus is having some impact in Ghana, but I also wondered if you could share with us how securing women's land and property rights might actually be helping to shift some of those dynamics that Patricia was just sharing with us um, and helping women to uh, empower themselves and protect their families from the virus. So Nana, over to you. And maybe not over to Nana because she dropped off. So actually, we're going to pivot over to Victoria. Thank you so much. Um, so Victoria, actually, let's move to you digging a little bit more deeply. Can you tell us how um, the spread of the virus is, in your experience, affecting women's ability to access and use land? 
Thank you, Carol. And I hope Nana Ama will come back to us because she has some, I think, important insights to offer. And I just want to say that I think, you know, the, the panelists who are on the ground are the ones who really are, are seeing the first effects of COVID. And so we're, we're in, in, in my organization, we're really trying to pay, play catch up. And um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is based on other experiences from other conflicts, um, post-disaster, post-conflict post type crises where we've seen similar things happening um, to women. And I think just to, to further uh, reiterate what um, Patricia said about, you know, this is really exacerbating already existing inequalities in, in our societies, right? So if you're already poor, then this whole crisis is going to make you more poor. And for women who are already suffering um, multi, multitudes of, of um, issues with regard to COVID, I think this can be very devastating if we aren't paying attention. And that's because so much of women's property rights is tied up in societal structures, right? So women in many countries acquire property through marriage, they acquire property through inheritance, or in many cases they don't acquire property through inheritance. And so when you have something that's disrupting those societal structures, like the death of a, of a spouse, for instance, you may find that women, the, the marriage is not formally registered. The woman's uh, identity may not be formally registered. And therefore, you know, she suddenly is in a very vulnerable position to be able to uh, protect her, her marital property. Um, in the case of inheritance, if a father dies and the daughters are, for some reason, um, either because of traditional practices or social norms not inheriting, then um, you know, they're even more dependent than on their husband and those family structures. And so I think you know, we really need to, to see this as part of a larger problem about um, societal norms and traditions and custom which may work fine in a normal situation, but in a, in a crisis like this, when everyone is stressed, when other sources of income are drying up and property may be the only asset that people have, then that will cause there to be um, you know, more pressure on those property rights and potentially more conflicts around those property rights. And women who have you know, these other vulnerabilities in society are going to be losing out more than anyone. So I really think that this is a vitally important topic, and I thank you so much for, for bringing us all together to talk about it, and I look forward to more of the discussion. I'll stop now. Great. Thank, thank you, Victoria, so much for sharing those thoughts and for really um, pointing out that there is a broader problem, and in crisis, the problem is being amplified. Um, Patricia, we're, we're going to do what Victoria just suggested, which is dig in a little more deeply into country level specifics. And we're gonna turn back to you now and, and ask you to talk about what you're seeing on the ground with some of the women you work with and the families you work with around women's abilities to access and use land uh, right now today and what you're seeing as um, some of the challenges around that. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, um, uh, based on our own experience and looking at what is happening in Brazil as a whole, I think that um, the, the issue of land insecurity is, is, um, is uh, huge, is massive. Because uh, first of all, let's say that because of the informality, it's because of the insecurity and the informality in all kinds of, uh, all levels of society. Informality in the land, informality in marriage, informality in inheritance. So, women are very much insecure in their land rights. So what we are, what we are seeing, it's uh, if you combine this with something that I cannot uh, keep not saying, uh, uh, which is the racism of this society and how in looking at this whole drama, how black women are on the front line they are in the front line in the schools, in the medical uh, situation, and they are dying because of this. They are low paid, but also um, they, they are facing the insecurity, 
let's say in the, when they they have the you know as the widows and we are already acting to protect their lands but also as informal workers and i think that's very necessary to go back in the informality of jobs and we just passed a law a few years ago that widened the informality and invisibility of work we have the whole majority of our population don't have any kind of social protection and they as um, as commissioner Pratt said they are fighting to feed their families okay so it's they are in the formal sector they work to feed their families on the next very next day so the drama that we are facing now is above from everything else on the political sense, like uh, land grabbing, illegal logging, this uh, government that's uh, taking the, the degree of uh, security that they have already have, some people already have, like in the indigenous in the Amazonia. But also they are putting a lot of stress on women. So the dilemma of women's living right now is between protecting themselves and keeping isolation in such horrible conditions or feeding their families. So our war right now is to save the people, the lives of the people from hunger. We are working very hard to try to protect those who are the most vulnerable to access the, uh, let's say, the emergency funds that the government are putting for the very low, the invisible population, but also trying to protect the people of the, the, you know, the dilemma of uh, going out to feed their families or being in isolation and trying to keep safe from uh, the virus. So it's a huge dilemma. It's a huge problem. It's, uh, um, it's a threat, it's a real threat in terms of uh, land and uh, human rights. I think that we are talking about food security. We are talking about adequate job and make us think what is going to be uh, our society after this pandemic. How are we going to cope with all these things that uh, are now so are, are shaking our society? They are shaking. They have been revealed something that was, uh, we knew, but it was not so clear. And I think that, um, yeah, Brazil right now, the huge uh, problem is that uh, land inequality and land insecurity, insecurity of land, food insecurity, it's a present, it's now, it's a struggle for today, it's not for tomorrow, it's a struggle for today. And how to protect these people most vulnerable, how to protect the indigenous people from the Amazonia. Uh, we, I'm sure most of people in this audience know that uh, we can see, we can witness the killing, massive uh, killing of uh, indigenous population due to uh, land dispute, illegal logging, illegal extractivism in the Amazonia and in other parts of Brazil. And everything done with the authorization of the national government. So I think that, uh, yeah, on the ground, the situation is really, we are in a war. Very, very challenging. Patricia, thank you for painting that picture for us, which is pretty bleak actually, between the challenges of disparate impacts on racial minorities, on black women particularly, the challenges of people who are living and living and depending upon the informal economy to feed their families, the untenable choices between feeding your family and protecting yourself, 
Um, it's really disturbing to hear what, what you're seeing in Brazil, but I think what you're seeing leads us directly into our next question. And so thank you for this. As women are trying to, and many of us know that women are uh, in many countries, primary agricultural laborers or a significant portion of agricultural laborers, as they're trying to walk this line that Patricia is talking about between feeding their families and protecting themselves, they need their fields in order, they need access to their fields in order to feed their families. So I wanted to turn to you next, Commissioner Pratt, and ask you, in addition to women's abilities to access and use land, whether these are constrained by social norms or biases or other inequalities that Patricia was talking about, what vulnerabilities are women facing today as people move back into rural areas from urban spaces? Or if you prefer, you can talk to what are the challenges women are facing as their spouses are dying and they're losing access to land that comes through a relationship with a husband, particularly. So Commissioner Pratt, please, over to you. And I hope we haven't lost Commissioner Pratt. I think I'm still here you are and still on here. video. I can't see you. <laughs> so thank you Pat, for the question. So like, like Patricia said, we have so many of the same uh, similar challenges, particularly when you look at the levels of poverty and you look at the threats to what she is seeing as indigenous and we are calling rural women, um, the threats of large scale concessions, the logging, the illegal occupations of land. Those are very real threats. 70% of small scale agricultural farming in Liberia. On land that they do not own. That's the significant Commissioner Pratt, for I'm most women who rely on this land to feed their families, to feed their children, and just to have. So when we start to look at the threats to land, we have to put that into that perspective. Now, you have a land rights measure of protection for women, for instance. Land was primarily held by the man, inherited by the man, passed on to the male lineage. The Land Rights Act tells you that each woman is a member of a community, and each community, I, I I'm so sorry, I don't know. We've cut out the video, so I'm not sure what else to do. Can anyone? Hmm. So, so, um, so you're in and out, and you have that fuzzy sound like you're underwater a bit. Um, why don't I actually turn over to Victoria, uh, ask her a similar question, and then let's come back to you to finish off. Does that work? Carol, also Nana Ama is back on, I think. Oh, excellent, good. Well, actually, so Victoria, let's just turn to you quickly, then we'll go back to Nana and we'll close this question off. And I apologize, I'm not sure what's happening. Sure, that's that's great. Okay, so, so um, Commissioner Pratt, let's do Victoria quickly and then Nana and we'll come right back to you to close us out. That's wonderful, thank you. Yeah, of course, no problem. And, and it's like an amazing thing anyway that we can talk to people all over the world. So let's just remember it's amazing. All right, so Victoria, let's, um, you and I are a little bit closer together, but let's, uh, so it's a little less amazing, but let's, let's turn back to you um, and, and talk about these specific vulnerabilities that come from people moving from urban spaces back to rural areas or the specific challenges women might face as spouses, for example, are passing away or partners are passing away and maybe marriages haven't been formalized. 
Well, I mean, I think it's it's going to depend a lot on the specific country context, obviously. Um, so in in the some cases, you know, um, if you have had a lot of male out migration uh, to cities for or or outside of the country for work, um, and now now they're returning home, that you know may um, exacerbate tensions within the household, especially if the uh, woman has sort of taken over the running of the household, the farming. We did an interesting study in Guatemala a few years ago, and one of the things that we found was that when women took over the farming, they tended to diversify their food crops in particular um, and grow a much more diverse selection of food items. And we know that men tend to focus much more on cash crops. Women tend to focus much more on food crops. So this may have an impact on food, food insecurity, for example, possibly. Um, I think, you know, it's really early to know what are the impacts, unfortunately. So a lot of this is guessing on the basis of, you know, other studies, other crises, as I said. Um, certainly, we have seen in other crises, um, you know, this impact on widows in particular, um, that, you know, women who are dependent on a husband for their property rights, either because of traditional practices in the area in which they live, in which case, um, if the husband dies, there may be pressure from the family to, you know, either uh, return some of the property. Um, certainly there have been cases of, you know, women being forced into marriages with other brothers. I mean, you know, these are all possibilities, but it's, it's very context specific and it's very hard to know what's going on. I did hear anecdotally from, um, a colleague um, with the Wairo Commission that um, she was seeing in Kenya widows, women who were already widowed, being forced out of the family property because of uh, quarantining and um, social distancing practices and the family really wanting to reduce numbers. And that was an easy one. You know, um, brother so-and-so's widow is, is not a member of our family and therefore, you know, we can force her out. So, you know, th these may be one-off, very limited situations. These may be prevalent across societies. We just don't know. And I think in urban areas, you know, we have other types of problems, as Patricia has already outlined, um, you know, with women, uh, you know, not having access to sanitation that they need uh, to keep their families safe and, uh, and themselves safe, having to go out and work in the informal economy, even though it's not safe. Um, all of these things, I think, we are seeing across the globe. Uh, you know, even in this country, in the United States, we're seeing these things happening. But the the extra vulnerabilities that women face are exacerbating that. I'll stop there. Victoria, thanks, thanks so much. And um, I think that's a really nice segue, actually, back to Nana Ama. Um, Nana, thanks. I'm glad you you could you were able to rejoin us. And um, I, I was curious to ask, uh, we know that the virus is having some impact in Ghana. Victoria was just talking about some of the challenges around family dynamics in the environment where there is this virus disrupting families and relationships. But can you talk to us for a minute about how the process of securing women's land and property rights might help to shift some of those dynamics within households and empower women? to protect themselves and their families? Yes, thank you very much, Carol. So um, it's totally correct to say that, yes, when a woman has secured land rights or property rights, it really has impact on the extent to which the woman is able to secure herself and her family in managing COVID-19. Because what is happening in now, both in urban and rural areas, is that we have situations where in the house you find women being very much careful and concerned about protecting themselves and their families. But men have the tendency to ignore or wash down the seriousness of the virus and its impact on households. And so the various measures, the restrictions, the precautions, protection that have come out that we each have to apply so that we protect ourselves and our families. You see women being at the forefront of getting these things done, but men ignoring it. So what is happening is that women are in danger because of the actions of the men 
who are with them in the house. But we have some few examples that illustrate the fact that if a woman has property rights, she is able to take action to protect herself. At least, I have one case of a middle-aged woman in Ghana, in Accra, who has a husband working in the forefront of the disease, but providing services to various hospitals and other places where those who have been infected are kept. When this man goes out to work and comes back home, when the woman is advising on what measures to put in place to protect himself and the rest of the family from infection, this man ignores it, and it becomes a fight. And it went on the first week, the second week. After a while, the woman realized that, no, this is not going to help. So she kicked the man out of the house. She made the man go out to find another place to stay, to conduct his business until everything is over and he can come home. I don't think that if the woman does not have that control over the property, she could take such a stand to protect herself and her children. So whilst we are talking about the fact that COVID-19 has implications on land rights, we also can flip the coin and say that in fact, the situation of COVID-19 on households is helping us to see that when we support women to have secured land and property rights, we able to give them that measure of authority to deal with situations that, have, that can have impact on the household, including a pandemic like COVID-19. So that is what is happening in Ghana. Fortunately, the numbers are not that high yet. In fact, the update this morning indicated that we are close to about 7,000 infections, and just a little over 2,000 have recovered, and less than 50 are dead. So we haven't gotten to that alarming situation yet. But it's because a lot of the things happening within the society is not helping to bring out the issues. We have stigma. Many people are stigmatized. Those who have been infected are stigmatized. And therefore, they don't, even if they are infected, they don't want to come out to do the testing. And so it's likely that there are cases within the community which is spreading and which is not coming out. Apart from that, we also have a situation where, in fact, the arrangement for information and education of the population is structured in such a way that it does not really touch on the core awareness raising concerns that many of the population have. And we know that women are mostly the ones who take care of such at the household level. So information is packaged and it is given out in the media in English in very technical messages. And so many women don't yet get the full extent of what they need to do and what this disease is all about. So it is a major gender concern that currently we look at as far as our case in Ghana is concerned. The other issue is the fact that there are so many issues regarding gender and gender mainstreaming and women's rights and so on. Those issues are in all sectors of our society. But because of COVID-19, now every attention is on fighting COVID-19 and managing it within Ghana. So nothing is happening. Nothing in terms of budget allocation, nothing in terms of programming, nothing in terms of monitoring, nothing in terms of research, nothing in terms of advocacy, nothing is happening. Everything is about COVID-19. And that is quite dangerous because what it means is that we have made certain gains prior to COVID-19. We needed to manage those gains made and build on them as we went along. But because of COVID-19 and restriction, we have halted everything we needed to do. The risk is that by the time COVID-19 is over and we turn back, we might find ourselves in a situation where 
if even we don't lack back, it is going to be difficult to see how to pick up from where we ended and continue because there is simply nothing going on to manage all these things that we were managing throughout the lines. And I'm talking about not only in the front of the civil society action, but even in the case of government policy action, government budget allocation, government priorities, and so on and so forth. And it is right that we pay attention to COVID-19 because it is not a global pandemic, and we want to make sure health care for those infected actually gets done. But the point is, that is not going to be the only situation we care for post-COVID-19. And so it will be better that we give attention to these other issues while we are still working to manage the disease. Otherwise, then we are going to have a situation where we will lose some of the gains made. And the final point on this, which I want to talk about, is about the leadership in managing the, the, the disease, COVID-19 task force, as we call it in many countries. So a task force is put together by government, and that task force is expect scientists and so on, medical doctors and so on, who are leading the strategy of handling the disease in the country. Like with many other situations, it's almost an all male, you know, scene. Of course, we are not saying the males are not needed in such efforts. But the point is, as it has been demonstrated time and again, when it is just one-sided, we always make decisions that do not influence all sectors of the society positively. And that's exactly what is happening in Ghana at the moment. So monies have been arranged to be given out. The arrangement, the strategy for giving out both monies is sidelining women. Arrangements are being made to get the traditional authorities to get them on board to handle matters. The arrangements are sidelining the queen mothers, and it goes on and on and on. So it is creating a whole lot of gender division with the system of managing COVID-19 at the national level. And if you come to the household level, the information in the sensitization is not going down well. And you go to the household level, you have situations where household dynamics influence the way women are able to take measures to protect themselves and their households. Nana, thank you um, so much for that, for the, those comments and for your observations. We really appreciate them. Um, we have about 10 minutes left in our conversation with the panelists and just a lot we'd like to still cover. So I'm going to quickly turn to Commissioner Pratt to address the question of um, losing that Nana raised this, this problem of losing ground on women's land rights as a result of the COVID crisis. Um, and then I'll turn back to the broader group and we'll, we have two uh, buckets of questions to get through. So I'm going to ask panelists to keep your remarks um, a little bit more uh, concise as we, as we come to our final couple of minutes because we have a lot of good questions coming in. So Commissioner Pratt, what about this issue of losing ground on women's land rights as a result of the virus? I wonder if you have any observations. And you may still be on mute. There we go. Okay, I'm sorry about that. So similar to what uh, Nama has experienced in Ghana, we've seen a lot of losses because one, there are no eyes and ears anymore. We had a robust communications campaign that was started. Um, we taken the Land Rights Act, we translated it into several local languages. 
also simplified the doctrine into something we in Liberia call simple inks. And now we have a lockdown. So everyone is back at their homes, back in Monrovia, and there's no work being done in the landscape, particularly the rural areas, to address this problem. So, so I, I think the issue of communication continues to come up and it is pivotal. We need to continue to engage and what we've been able to do at the land of aid, the seriousness of these issues. So now the land services are now here at this work. And to go back into the landscape, to the, the land graph, all of those while we have this lockdown and we are back from these challenges. Thank you, Carol. I think we have a, uh, an issue again. Unfortunately, Commissioner Pratt, it seems like we do have an issue with the internet for you. Um, I'll share with folks who are on the line with us a very interesting thing that um, Commissioner Pratt had noted, which is that it might be appropriate for some land administration authorities to be designated as essential workers. Uh, and so there is an opportunity for them to continue doing their work, particularly um, in maybe some of the harder to reach areas where it can be challenging for men and for women uh, to access services otherwise. So Commissioner Pratt, thank you so much for that. So now I'm going to turn uh, to our final question for the panelists. I'd like to encourage folks who are uh, sharing questions with us um, to continue submitting their questions. My final question uh, is as follows. We just talked a lot about um, what's going on on the ground, Victoria. Uh, you had noted that the World Bank is just starting to, is, is in the process of thinking about how to respond to some of the challenges around women and property rights. I want to focus on what needs to be done tomorrow, next month, next year. So um, Victoria, I'm going to start with you. What do you think donor organizations should be doing over the course of the next several months and the coming years to address some of the problems that we've heard our other panelists discuss? And then I'll turn over to Patricia. Okay, so as briefly as I can, because that's a huge question. Um, I think in the short term, we are doing things already. In the short term, I think it's really important to look at this in a very holistic way. So as has already been outlined, you know, women are having issues with regard to income, with regard to safety. So we need to be looking at this in terms with our social protection colleagues to ensure that women are being targeted for, you know, any kind of social protection payments. We need to be looking at this with our colleagues in infrastructure who are retooling projects now to do more labor intensive public works, you know, as a, as a way of generating employment. But that, of course, also needs to make sure that women are being included, that they're being targeted, but that there's a safe workplace for them. So protections against harassment in the workplace and also to ensure that they're being paid fair wages. So there's a whole lot of things that we're trying to do um, in a holistic way. I think in terms of, of you know, property rights um, in particular, I think that um, moratoriums on evictions and uh, foreclosures are very important. They're very important in this country. They're important everywhere. Um, and other measures that ensure that people do not lose their homes, uh, regardless of their gender, but in particular women. Um, we also would like to see um, you know, uh, temporary measures, perhaps that could be further made permanent that you know, women are not allowed to sign over their inheritance rights at this time because they're under a lot of, they may, be, they may be under a lot of pressure to do that. I mean, again, this is very context specific. I think in the longer term, um, you know, we need to recognize that gender neutral land laws are not sufficient, um, that we need to do more with regard to thinking about this across these different um, inheritance practices, social norms, and other uh, ways that women interact with property through family and how we can help women to know their rights, enforce their rights, and then have the state recognize those rights. And that's a lot of, of work that needs to be done. Um, I would say that asking women is very important. So organiz organizations like Colandiv and Espacio Feminista are so important for this work. 
And of course, um, I also have to mention the Stand for Her Land campaign, okay. which is a campaign we have launched, launched uh, with a number of organizations, including Landessa, um, to uh, advocate for women's land rights around the globe. You can find out more at Stand for the number for herland.org. And um, you know, it, it's really an opportunity for all of us to get involved and to see how we can help to, um, to protect women's property rights. That's great. Thank you, Victoria. And really appreciate that focus on holistic responses and protection. Uh, Patricia, I'm going to turn to you now. Can you please share, us, share with us your thoughts on what civil society should be doing in the medium or longer term to address these challenges and the intersections of COVID with women's vulnerabilities? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, um, first of all, I would like to answer some of the questions. And uh, by uh, answering to your question, I would like to first of all say that civil society is seen right now as an important, uh, let's say, important actors working um, to protect uh, people from COVID. So the uh, civil society is working a lot. We have a campaign, we are acting from the very first day, we are acting to link the rural and the urban and we have a, a, a very nice initiative that's like it's getting food from the rural to feed the urban poor, the urban in, in hunger situation and also the urban uh, producing masks to like to protect the rural. So there are a lot of, uh, let's say good, initiatives going on and uh, but I would like to focus on the questions in the you know, uh, let's say mid and the long run I think that uh, what we uh, we have been doing and I'm going to talk about espacio feminist work is uh, collecting data and the answering to the question that someone asked me about the the importance of working with local government and the state government. We have this national government, it is a disaster, but somehow we are protected because uh, we decided to work uh, from a bottom up approach, which means we can influence in the lives of women if we work and collect data, collect evidence to unfold all these questions that we are talking about, inheritance problems, insecurity of land, protecting women's land rights, if you have evidence. And if you can, let's say, uh, use the evidence, and it's women's using the evidence to build good governance. And that's a, 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 like a calling for donors to invest in these kind of initiatives. I have been talking a lot about the bottom-up approach. We need to have to build evidence. We need to build uh, data to inform governments and really to do good practice to secure women's land rights like we did in Ponte do Maduro a few years ago, like we did in Bonito, we are doing a huge, let's say, land regularization process that will benefit 7% of the, the lands are going to be issued on the name of women. That's very important. We cannot do this with Bolsonaro. But we can do this with Bonito government. We can do this if you have um, data that is uh, gender, gender analysis, that is gender disaggregated. So I think that we have to look at uh, this pandemic and what is happening as an alert and also as a, a way of saying we have civil society have good practice uh, many groups and we are all connected. When I'm talking about Spasso Feminista, Spasso Feminista is working on the ground in the communities, but we are linked to uh, the whole Latin America. We are linked to many national groups. So we are in dialogue with many national groups in the Amazonia, in the South, in the whole Latin America through the International Land Coalition. So we have to learn from each other. Uh, we need to reinforce our practices and our um, 
let's say, good, good practice and uh, learn from the whole diversity. In the feminist learning platform, we are working globally, you know, taking advantage of the whole diversity and the whole plurality that people from Morocco or people from uh, Spain, Africa. So I think that we, we have to build bridges and the land community and the international donors, they have to pay attention to this practice and hang fast the, pro the, the uh, let's say, invest in this kind of uh, practice in order for us to really to build and to give a contribution towards what is going to be, uh, <clears throat> let's say, the world post-COVID. What is going to be uh, our society post-COVID with a deepening of uh, economic crisis, the deepening of, um, um, uh, how can I say, impacts on women's land rights, the challenges against widows, challenges against uh, the most vulnerable groups. We haven't talked about domestic violence. In Brazil, there is a rise of 50% of in domestic violence due to isolation. So I think that there are a lot to be done, but uh, I would call uh, to pay attention to civil society, to the good, good practice that are on the ground. And especially, it's easier for us to work with local governments and state governments. So excellent, Patricia, thank you so much. And thanks at the very end for raising the gender-based violence issue, which maybe we can get to in questions, if not in this conversation. Um, so we're about four minutes over the hour and I wanna give Nana a chance for a brief comment on this question of what civil society should be doing to address the challenges of COVID in the, in the shorter and longer terms. And then we'll close off with Commissioner Pratt, who I understand has switched her connection. And so we should be able to hear her to close us out. So Nana, for a brief comment from you on what, what, else, should the civil, what else should civil society be doing? So I think I couldn't agree with Patricia Moore when she said that we needed to document and show evidence. I think it's exactly what we need to do. Because usually when you are raising concerns about issues occurring, which need attention, then it is assumed that you are making these things up, especially when it's about women. So we want to document what is occurring now. And actually that is what we are doing. So for example, in the cases of the traditional leaders and what is happening in terms of the, um, the disconnects between the chiefs and the queen mothers, it is happening. And even COVID-19 and its money, it Just at a critical moment with Nana Ama. Darn it. So let's give let's give Nana another moment to see if she can come back to us. And if not, all right. So Nana, hold tight for a second. Let's switch over to Commissioner Pratt. And Commissioner Pratt, while we're waiting for Nana to see if she can rejoin, I'm let back. Oh, good, there you are. Okay, good. I'm Continue on, Nana. Behaving funny today, but monitoring what we have done previously with it. So before COVID nineteen, there were things that were happening both at the policy level and the community level. We haven't left it all like that. We are still holding our taps on all the things that were happening and checking to see. So for example, we were monitoring and advocating on the land bill. Even though they are not seriously considering it, we know that it is still something that will be considered. So we are following up. We are also working with the contacts in the community levels to monitor because we do not want the situation to go far before we go back to rectify. We want to get all the signals and see what can be done even under this condition. 
A third thing we think is important to do, and it is something that I have been talking about a lot with many of the actors in Ghana, that we need to mainstream land rights and particularly women's land rights in all program interventions at the community level. Okay, so that's a great thought for us on mainstreaming women's land rights and land rights more generally, at, at, particularly at the community level. Um, I'm afraid we, uh, for me anyway, Nana is frozen again, which is unfortunate. So Nana, um, I'm sure if you can hear me, uh, let's say, let's uh, thank you for that intervention. And let me close off this section of the conversation by turning back to Commissioner Pratt Nana, if we can finish your thoughts and questions, we'll do that. So Commissioner Pratt, for you, the final question, what do you think land agencies or land administration offices should be doing differently over the coming months and years to meet this historic challenge? Thank you again. And um, as we're ending, I want to say that exactly what we see on this call, a combination of the government, civil society, the donor community coming together and integrating, don't, coming together integrating is exactly how we need to combat this challenge, right? And I think we need to look as we go forward at these partnerships. Government cannot do it alone. Civil society cannot do it alone. The donor community needs to have an implementing partner. So how we all work together and how we integrate women's land rights into all facets of land reform is going to be critical. Additionally, where Ghana is still trying to pass a land bill and advocacy is strong, that's where we were two years ago. Now we are at implementation. So we fought for this policy, we fought for this law. How do we now effectively implement it so we start to see the catalytic change that we expect to see when a pivotal law such as this one has passed? And again, it cannot happen without the awareness, without the communications, so many of our rural women still do not understand what this law means for them because historically land has not been something they've ever had to control or own. So how do we help to educate this populace? How do we work together so that gender is integrated throughout our society? I think what Patricia said, what um, Victoria has said, what Nana has said, it all comes together. It has to be evidence-based. We need to continue to get the data because we always hear, we don't know what the issues are. So let's find out what the issues are. You know, I will take this time to thank Landessa for working with the Land Authority on a study. And that study was to see how women are using wetlands in peri-urban and urban areas for livelihood creation, right? So that study is going to inform a land use and management policy that we're about to do. You know, we have a World Bank support um, for, on a project. Victoria was one of our task team leads. So all this expertise is coming to Liberia and we need to take full advantage of it. So I want to say thank you again for this opportunity and I look forward to engaging this entire month on land rights and women land rights. Thank you so much. Commissioner Pratt, thank you so much for that eloquent conclusion. So in partnership, we're going to be working together across our different organizations to educate, to integrate, and to elevate the issue of women's land rights, um, both in the COVID, uh, COVID environment and, and otherwise. So we've covered a lot of ground over the course of the last hour or so. Uh, we had been a little, uh, we had hoped to cover even more ground, but you guys are, are helping us to address some issues we didn't get to in the questions. Uh, I'm going to turn now to some of the questions. We have just under 20 minutes, so that's a lot of time for questions. Uh, I will take a few questions. I'll direct them to our panelists, and if we don't get to your question, uh, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. We may not get to every one, but we'll try to respond to as many as we can. So. Um, I'm going to stay with you, Commissioner Pratt, to start off with a question. To what degree does, does or do the associated costs of documentation and documentation of land records continue to contribute to, the marg to women's marginalization? Um, so again, what about how do the costs and uh, cost time barriers contribute to marginalization? And do you have any thoughts on which countries are showing improvements? 
Okay. So thank you so much for the question. That question is at the heart of why we are in the land administration reform now. Liberia has a very manual system of registration and land information. And as you know, when you deal with paper, there's where conflict can come in, that's where fraud comes in. So we have a major problem with that. We are not documenting rights properly. I think um, about 20% of our land is currently documented and deeded. That means there's 80% out there that we don't know who owns it. We're trying to get the ownership. A lot of it is in customary ownership, which we are now trying to formalize. And in that formalization, there will be significant protection for women. So that is the good thing. However, with the fact that there's so many uh, records that were lost after 14 years of civil conflict, after um, records have been transferred from several agencies to now the Liberia Land Authority, you've got records that have been lost, misplaced, have been deliberately taken out. There's a lot of fraud. And I think that affects a lot of women because not only a lot of women own land um, verbally, right? So someone says, don't worry about the paper trail, the land is yours. But then when it comes to the legal issue, no, the land is not yours. And you've not been able to prove that is yours because you don't have documentation. So I think those are some of the challenges that we see, but definitely Liberia is behind in migrating from um, a manual to an electronic process. And that I think will help to alleviate a lot of the concerns that we have. That's great. Thank far, you. Yeah. Sorry, can please, please finish up, Commissioner Fred. Well, I would say that as far as countries that we see, I mean, we've done a lot of peer engagements with uh, other African countries. So we've seen um, the amount of effort Rwanda has put into their land reform. We've seen what Botswana has done, Mozambique. I mean, there's so many, but there's so many good examples of countries that have reformed their land agenda and they were similar to us before. So we're, we're partnering with them. We're doing a lot of peer exchanges with our colleagues from some of those countries and learning the best practices. Thank you. Thank you so much. And really appreciate that, that um, those observations. Let me uh, turn to Nana now. Nana, here's a question for you. Um, is it, do you have the sense that there's added pressure as a result of COVID for, I, for women to sign over their inheritance rights to land or to property? Are you seeing any of that in your country? And we may ask Patricia the same question in a moment, but first um, to Nana. So, sorry, Carol, but I didn't get every part of the question about okay. inheritance. Isn't so it? A question, if, if, the, if, the situ if people are, um, if you're facing problems of family members dying as a result of COVID. Are, are you hearing any stories of women facing pressure to give up their inheritance in this environment or is that really not an issue right now in Ghana or West Africa? Uh, no, it's not an issue right now. But what the issue is right now is the stigma and its impact on other things related to the households and so many people who have the disease are being stigmatized instead of getting the support, especially in our case where we, de we deal with the extended family setting. It's not happening like that. So the infected person is being stigmatized. And in some cases, even when the person has been treated and has to go home, then there is that kind of reservation. So some, I remember there was this documentary where a woman was saying that she would prefer to stay in quarantine for some time because she doesn't even know the kind of reception she's going to have when she goes home. So stigma is a major issue and it is influencing a lot of the relationships within households and within communities. Okay, good. A point we hadn't raised before that issue of stigmatization. Patricia, what are you seeing in Brazil? Are, are women facing any pressures? around inheritance or daughters facing any pressures around inheritance in a COVID environment? Yes, yes, of course, uh, there will be a lot of, um, you know, pressure on land, of course. And uh, what we are doing, in fact, um, you know, to the extent of our work 
it's uh, first of all we are as i said before we are collecting data and uh, i have to say that we are collecting official data comparing official data let's say the agriculture census 2006 comparing to the 2017 and we have the whole databases official produced by the national statistic so we have a very good uh, how can i say have a very good uh, um, information and a very good uh, databases of what was in 17 you know so um, but more specifically what we are doing right now i mean in spanso feminista besides what we already did before which is uh, protecting women's land rights, like in Jacare, uh, fighting for the, the community to ensure their right. We are also supporting communities, and it's a broader sense to, uh, like, say, to react immediately. So we set up a kind of a support, a legal support for the women. And if they, uh, there are lots of cases uh, in which their husband died, and they don't get neither uh, the document of the land or the right to the pension. So we are supporting these groups with, uh, let's say, uh, legal procedures so that it is, it's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. The number of cases of people, widows, are the ones that are most vulnerable. We used to say that uh, when someone dies, uh, when a man died, the widow, during the assembly, the, the funeral, people already approached the widow to buy their lands, to get their land. So it's a huge problem in Brazil, especially when you are in informality, like we have. So yes, we are preparing and we are informing the groups, supporting the groups, so that we don't have uh, too much within our capacity, but there will be a lot of uh, problems in Brazil. People are just one point that's very important. People are asked to resign from their job, getting all the rights that they have, you know, by their employers because of COVID. So we see a lot of problems related to this disease and the um, land but also other labor labor rights and other issues that are very important and um, yeah we have to be prepared and use the data once again evidence data is key for us from agenda analysis it's not just getting the data out of ibge or whatever getting an analysis agenda analysis and looking how bad this let's say this land has been um, triggered, how bad, how many people have completely insecure of land rights, this, the economic development, how they are putting pressure on land. We have just a blog, it was supposed to be translated today, which analyzed a specific area in which a huge development project was um, uh, put in place and uh, the impact on women's land rights was terrible. So I think that, uh, yeah, civil society is there. I think that uh, data and, uh, you know, monitoring is, is very important for us to be prepared for what is uh, after COVID, you know, the and years, the months and years <laughs> after yeah, COVID. Um, absolutely. So really good point. And um, let me just underscore again for those Folks who are with us, uh, Patricia's group, Patricia has a new blog that's coming out on the issue, or it may, I think it's already posted uh, in Portuguese at least, and perhaps coming quickly in English on the case she just mentioned. So please go ahead and visit to find that. Victoria, I want to turn to you um, and add, there's a really interesting question around what happens um, as, as, there, as people are moving are, and there may be a need to integrate uh, either migrants or rural pe or urban peoples into rural settings. Do you have any, um, any uh, examples of good lessons on how to address women's land rights when there is a relocation from areas where there's high concentration urban areas um, so that you can help 
both to deal with the problem of the virus, but also to promote some economic resilience. So it's a little bit of a challenging question. How do you integrate people into areas in these kinds of difficult environments, natural resource, dis natural disaster or, or virus? Okay, over to you. Yeah, that is a very challenging question. And I don't think there's any simple answer. I think it really is going to require, um, you know, under, I mean, I think as Patricia was saying, this is where you need data and this is where you need analysis to understand what is the situation on the ground that you're dealing with. And then how you integrate, uh, you know, a new community, um, I think is really about, um, you know, it's about, it's about, negotiation and it's about understanding the needs of both those communities and how can that be, how can you find sort of that win-win situation? I, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I'm sure that there are like 42 dissertations that have been written on this in other contexts, but I would just say um, that, um, you know, that we do have, we do have evidence from, as I said, from sort of post-disaster, post-conflict contexts that you know, I think provides some good um, ideas about, for instance, you know, the cadastral reconstruction in Aceh, Indonesia after the tsunami was very intense in engaging with women in those communities because, in many cases, women were the survivors, and really, you know, the records were gone. You know, it wasn't just that they had been some records had been tampered with. I mean, they were completely gone. And so really, you know, I think engaging with women on the ground to understand and, and to use them as fountains of, no of local knowledge to rebuild that cadaster is a wonderful um, experience that, you know, I think could have lessons for many. Uh, Colombia in its restitution process has been very, there are lots of other problems, but I think on, on the gender side, they have been very sensitive to women's needs, recognizing informal uh, marriages and really trying to support women throughout the entire process. Um, as as uh, Patricia said, I mean, legal assistance is not something that ends once you know what your rights are. You then have to enforce them and, and continue enforcing them. So I'll, I'll stop there. No, that's great. Those are a couple of really nice practical examples from Indonesia as well as from Colombia. And your final point is really the whole point of the Stand for Her Land campaign which is that there may, you know, we're in a situation today where there are oftentimes quite good laws and they may be gender sensitive. Um, some cases they may be gender responsive, but the implementation on the ground is sorely lagging behind. And so how you close that gap between what the laws say, how you close the gap between awareness and exercising rights is critical. I wanna turn to a question that's come in that I, I think, um, We've touched on a little bit, but we can maybe uh, do a little bit more to reinforce. And that's a question around, that's a question that's really sort of the following. So what we're talking about today, are we talking about issues that might happen in the future or as, and particularly as the pandemic worsens, or are we talking about what's already happening today on the ground? And so I think Patricia particularly has given us some examples of what's happening on the ground today in Brazil. She lives in a highly impacted environment. Um, Ellen, as well as Nana Ama have been giving us some examples of what they've been seeing in their regions. I will briefly, briefly share a story from my colleague, Dr. Monica Mahoja from a week or so ago who told me she's trying to help a widow right now who's in Dar es Salaam who has been forced to um, stay in place because of travel restrictions and limitations, but whose property in Arusha is now being sold by someone in the village and she cannot travel back to stop the illegal sale. So yes, things are happening on the ground and people are taking advantage of women, but I did wanna turn back to Nana if you're, still, if you're with us and able to participate again, Nana. Do you have any other examples that you'd like to share with us from, from your country about how this is impacting women? Yeah, so um, what we are talking now, look, going back to the main question as to, is it what is happening now or is it what we are asking? It is both. Both because currently some of these things are happening where at the household level, women have a lot of pressure 
in managing the household and matters relating to the household property because of COVID-19. But moving forward, because of what we have as all attention being given to COVID-19 to the neglect, for want of a better way, to the neglect of other things, we are saying that by the time we are over and done with COVID-19, we would now have, we have lost some ground in the game to make. And therefore, it will draw us back. So it is both in the present and in the future. In terms of what is happening, other examples for women, the point is that we have a lot of uh, investment where you have continent, so much, uh, foreign companies, and in some cases, local companies, operating large concessions for agriculture and other activities in the rural areas. Because there is no monitoring, there is no attention, things are happening over there where some take over the land. In fact, in recent, I think about two weeks ago, there was the incident where a large area of cocoa farm being turned into a mining area where small scale mining activities have been undertaken. And the, the garlics in the cocoa farm show that, in fact, there is no possible to go back to that farm for any activity. So it is posing a lot of danger to all land rights holders today, including women. And the reason we are protecting women is because, among all other factors, when these facts come to play an impact on land rights, the situation of women becomes worse off because they do not have the same level of articulation at policy level, at decision making level, at all levels. They are not there. And so it becomes a challenge for them. And so it is a threat, women's land rights today. It's a threat, a potential threat to women's land rights tomorrow, and it's a threat to the women's land rights advocacy in the future because of has been now. Nana, thank you so much for bringing us to the end of the discussion in such, such a thoughtful manner. So our challenge moving forward and the challenge of those of you who are on the phone and interested in this issue is, as one of the other participants said, to build back better for women's land rights, to make sure that we're helping women protect themselves, their families, their communities, through practical activities and efforts that some of our panelists this morning have been, all of our panelists have been talking about. And we'll continue this conversation next week in a very practical focused uh, discussion section. And it'll draw on not only this week's, uh, today's conversation, but the conversations from the rest of the week. So um, we are at time. I want to take a moment and thank our panelists so very much for taking the time to be with us today. I want to thank Commissioner Pratt. I want to thank Patricia Chavez. I want to thank Nana Amayura. And also, I want to thank Victoria Stanley, a great group of panelists to discuss a very difficult and challenging issue. I also want to thank our wonderful colleagues at the Land Portal. Neil and Laura and Stacy, thanks for making the, the whole process so easy. And thanks especially to you, the participants, for being with us here today. We appreciate your time and attention, and we look forward uh, to your participation in the webinar series the rest of the week. Thank you so